in case you wonder where I am, I'm coming from behind a jungle and this big plant is an elm. Again, I'm going to show you the archive photographs of this tree because this tree started off life as a plant from my hedge. When I came to the nursery in 1985-86, I dug it out of the hedge and put it in an aluminium plant box and it was grown as a bonsai for the last 35 years. And over the last couple of years, I put it in this big plastic bonsai pot and of course, it's gone absolutely crazy. It's gone so crazy that I don't know where to start. But underneath this mass of foliage, there is a very beautiful bonsai. And you must be wondering, how is it that it's growing so strong? It's growing so strong because if you leave plants on the ground and if the roots go into the ground, there's always a danger that these trees will revert and become big trees and cease to be bonsai. So, I know that this tree has rooted in the ground in just one year. Because I know I put it in this plastic pot only a year ago. So, bear with me. It has absolutely rooted away. But I think I can get it out. Can you see the roots in there? So that is what has happened to this tree. Look at it. The roots have gone right into the ground. And look at the roots have come out. And that is what has made the tree so vigorous. But there comes a time when I can't leave it going like this forever. So, look at all these roots. Look at that thick root. And that's going to make a root cutting because all elms grow from root cuttings. <coughs> so this is this big elm. Let's do a bit of trimming and bring it back to its original state. You will have seen this tree in some other videos, I'm sure. Okay. Believe it or not, these are the trees that give me the most enjoyment. So how do I tackle a tree like this? So, I can imagine that many of you will be speaking and thinking the sort of words that I, I say. Now, I will just take a pause because I'm going to bring another tool to show you. So with a beast like this, it's almost like a hedge. So rather than waste my time with the bonsai tools or secateurs, let me begin by doing some trimming with these hedging shears. You wouldn't think that I can use hedging shears to do bonsai, but there is a place for everything. So, look at that. Anyone would laugh at me doing this. But after all, I've always used the analogy of hedging with bonsai. I've always said that if you didn't prune your hedge once or twice a year, it will soon become completely unkempt. And what better tool to use for a, a bonsai like this than my hedging shears. So there is a time and place for everything. Look at these shoots, 60 to 70 centimeter long in just a couple of months. Just a couple of months. It's absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. This, by the way, is an English elm, not a Chinese elm. English elms used to grow prolifically in this country, in the UK, uh, for centuries. And it was only in 1960s, about 50 years ago, that there was a disease called Dutch elm disease. And Dutch elm disease is caused by a type of beetle that goes into the trunk of the tree, in fact, the bark of the tree. And once they go into the bark, it introduces, I believe, a virus which affects the trees and causes the trees to die. 
Elm trees, when they grow in the wild or in nature, they grow to about 100 or sometimes 150 feet tall, and they're beautiful stately trees. I remember when I came to the UK in 1963, where I lived in Kent, I used to see quite a lot of these elms. And even in Sussex, there were lots of elm trees that were beautiful like this, but they suddenly all died. And I certainly think that by the 1970s and 80s, 10 or 20 years after that, many of the elms were just dying like flies. But they say that the ones that grow in the hedgerows, the suckers come up. We're telling you that elms grow from root cuttings. The suckers also grow very prolifically. And these suckers become little trees. But as soon as they get big, they become susceptible to the Dutch elm disease. But I've grown a lot of English elm from suckers, from the hedgerow, and I've found that they certainly don't die. They don't catch the disease. It's only the big trees that catch the disease. So, so when we say that bonsai is just sophisticated topiary, people will laugh, especially the bonsai people. They don't want to cheapen the art. But let's face it, this is what bonsai is all about. It's doing topiary in a different way. And many of you who are in Europe will know that all this beautifully topiary work in France, in Versailles and all these famous gardens, I mean, that is an art in itself and should be admired for what it is. So let's not get too sophisticated and too proud by saying that bonsai is not topiary. It is what we call sophisticated topiary, however much you might think otherwise. Now let me just steady it on the turntable. As you know, I'm a very crazy fellow. People laugh at me for growing bonsai this size. But nothing gives me greater pleasure than growing bonsai of this size. As I've always said, even from my very first books, the size of bonsai is just like when you deal with art in painting and sculpture. A large painting and a large sculpture gives a completely different feeling from a small piece of painting or small piece of sculpture. The feeling it evokes is quite, quite different. And so it is with bonsai. And many of my customers who are crazy like me, they also like these big bonsai. And I always remind people who are new to bonsai that if you were to go to China, the home of bonsai, where bonsai originated, you will still see to this very day bonsai which are 15 feet, four or five meter tall. And in big pots made of granite and marble, not always ceramics because you can't make ceramic pots that big. And those are the trees that I exhibited as prize specimens of bonsai. So different cultures have different perceptions of bonsai. And this is what makes the art such a, a thriving and vivid art. So many ways of expressing the bonsai. So, you can see the value of this tool. Hedging tool, I've done that in less than three minutes. And if I don't talk so much, I can do it even faster. So there you are. I brought it back to shape. But that is only the first step. The next step is to create structure in the trees. So as with any bonsai, the first thing always to do is to create the outline. Fundamental principle, create the outline and then go in and create the, the ramification and structure. And of course, some of you clever people will tell me, why don't you do it in winter? Because that's the time you see the structure best. Yes, you can do it in winter, very good thing to do in winter. But of course, if you do it in the dead of winter, sometimes you can cause dieback because the exposed cuts may not survive so well. Now I'm going into the structure, anything going upwards, I'm taking off because I'm trying to create horizontal layers. And 
the habit of most plants is to grow vertically. And of course, all elms grow from cuttings very easily. So if anyone wants English elm cuttings, come to the nursery and I'll give you for free. Each of these, if you stick it into the soil, will make a plant. They're so easy to grow, so easy to grow. There are some people, and I admire them, who only love growing the so-called native species. That means they like growing English elm, English beech, and that is very, very credible. Uh, creditable, I mean, uh, to grow these indigenous species for what they are. I'm all for growing native species because not everything has to be exotic. Just because the Chinese and Japanese grow particular species, it doesn't mean that you have to grow it uh, in Europe. You know, the native species are as nice. Of course, I'm doing this tree a service because if there's too much foliage, the light doesn't get into the structure of the tree. And if you don't let light in, the inside twigs and branches will die. So look at these thick nodes and shoots. I'm thinning some of these. And there are pads in here, believe it or not. If we were to come closer, I will show you what the pads look like. If you look in here, look at that pad here. See, these are the pads which are forming. You see the pads coming out? Now this is shooting upwards. I'm going to take that off. Anything which is growing upwards, I take off. And I'm going to create flat pads right through. See another one here? This is growing upwards. I don't want that, so I'm going to take it back, making it flat. So now the detail work starts. It's all very well doing the outline, but at some stage you have to go inside and create the detail. The other elm which I often use is the Siberian elm, and that's also a very vigorous tree, very lovely tree. That's a European elm, so that makes a very fine bonsai. In fact, for the European climate, I think they are better than the Chinese elm. I know the Chinese elm grows uh, easily anywhere, but these native elms also do well. There is another elm called the, uh, what is it, Scottish elm, I think it is which has very large leaves, but fortunately the English elm has very small leaves. So elms that have large leaves may not be that suitable. I don't expect everyone to work at the speed that I work. You can see how I'm creating the layers and spaces between the different pads. And there are these suckers galore from below. I'm going to get these out. This, by the way, is only the back side. I can show you while we're looking at the back. This tree has had a couple of cuts in its, in its life as a bonsai. When I dug it out of the hedge in 1985-86, that was the first cut I made over here. And it's become hollow because that's where the cut was done. And then another cut was made there. And then a major cut was made here, which is now callousing. And then the taper has been grown. So it's really only two major cuts that have been made in the past 35 or 36 years that I've been 
training this as a bonsai. So these are the major decisions one makes when you create bonsai. But once you've made it, it will be more or less set for life and the taper will be set for life. So this is how I've created in a short space of about five, maybe seven minutes, the layers to the back side of the tree. Now let's look at the front side of the tree. Now this is the front, it's leaning slightly and I want to emphasize the trunk. Look at that grand trunk, beautiful trunk. You notice all I'm using is my trusted Felco secateurs. No sophisticated bonsai tools. As long as it does the job, that's all that matters. Look at the prunings. If I were to propagate all these into cuttings, I would have thousands and thousands of elms to sell on. I'm still trying to find layers and spaces between the branches to create the pad effect. Let me stand back and have a look. Standing back to have a look is very important because if you don't have a strategic view from the rear or from a distance, you lose sight of what you're trying to create. This is exactly the same in all other spheres of life. You have to stand back to get a strategic view. See, in fact, by removing all those unwanted branches and twigs, the whole tree becomes bigger in appearance. It becomes more grand because you've got that miniature scale, whereas if you didn't do that, the tree would just be a blob. It would just be a round bush. But now you can see the structure. You can envisage the shape of a mighty tree as you would find in nature. So that certainly didn't take long. And look at all that pruning. Look at all that stuff. How much I've pruned. So you can now see the great big trunk. And this tree will continue to grow. Some of the branches at the back people might criticize, but I'm not too worried. I will probably leave it to make it grow thicker. I can carve some of these roots to make it look 
as if there are thinner roots, so that certainly could be carved. I won't do that today. I'll probably do it another time. And so this is an exercise in pruning this lovely tree. So there you are. I've let it grow strong and I've now brought it back. So I hope you've enjoyed this little video.